internet studio, we have Kelly V. Hey. Welcome. You're in Florida, right? <laughs> yes. Okay, good. Florida. Never been. Someday I will. She's affiliated with C4SS. She's an individualist, anarcha feminist, and proud ADHD-er, whose philosophy can best be described as Emma Goldman meets Ayn Rand, which is intriguing. Uh, she came to liberty from conservative roots after reading Atlas Shrugged in 11th grade and became an anarchist approximately two weeks after meeting an anarchist for the first time. She graduated from Tulane University in 2016 with degrees in accounting and finance, which she puts to good use when she's not writing about mental health, feminism, and the state, which are excellent topics. She lives in <laughs> Florida with her husband, who we know and like at non room as well, and their various cat children. How many cat children do you have? We have four. Ooh, I had two. Lot. He had two. So when we merged households, it was a lot. It Step is a lot. <laughs> yeah. Um. Okay. So I have just by reading your bio, I always have like too many questions and avenues I might want to go down. But uh, you were conservative at some point. You're a you're Emma Golden plus Ayn Rand. What's your political journey been? And like, what do you call yourself now if someone came up to you and just asked, hey, what are your politics? Yeah. So um, in terms of my political journey, my parents were probably my parents got me interested in politics, especially my dad. Um, Both of my parents now are pretty conservative, unfortunately, um, but neither were originally. My mom was raised progressive and she became more conservative uh, largely due to Clinton's presidency is what she points to like like the Monica Lewinsky incident and the way that feminists turned on Monica Lewinsky in defense of Bill Clinton really bothered her Waco really bothered her Um, and then the don't ask don't tell thing really bothered her. Now, given that those are all the things that bothered her, I don't know how she's okay being conservative, but it is what it is. (laughs) All those things bother me too, I think, really. Right, right, yeah. And then my dad originally, I mean, his parents are Democrats, but he was a libertarian from a pretty young age. Mm -hmm. He joined the LP in the 70s, and he wrote for reason once. Nice. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah and and I think he just got jaded with age and then he and he was never super radical he 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 read some Rothbard and stuff but I don't think he ever called himself an anarchist and then 9-11 is where he really went from libertarian to like neoconservative yeah that was a thing huh yeah <laughs> um and so growing up I mean, I was, what, six when 9-11 happened. Um, So my parents were conservative for most of my life, but with libertarian leanings in terms of some of their values that rubbed off on me, I've always been like a very independent person. And I think the things that were, that I liked about conservatism at a young age were the things that most frequently overlap with libertarianism. And so middle school I was like very very into arguing with people at school (laughs) um, (laughs) about politics but it was always like parroting my parents views and I don't Mm -hmm. think I really started to try to establish my own views until more like high school started calling myself more of a libertarian instead of a conservative because I was more socially liberal and then I read Atlas Shrugged and in 11th grade and I was like I'm I'm an objectivist now was that an assignment (laughs) or how did you find Atlas Shrugged it it was an assignment weirdly enough I had an English teacher who assigned that in my AP language class and I think I was the only person who actually read it all the way through (laughs) can't say Um, I ever got through it (laughs) yeah it's a long one (laughs) not yet at least you never know it's a long one, but yeah, I, it really sucked me in. So I started calling myself an objectivist. I was still pretty bad on foreign policy and on abortion, actually. Like mm-hmm. I, I was very religious as a kid um, and really through high school was very religious and never really questioned that view, even though I had become more accepting of like LGBT 
issues and stuff like that by then. Um, it, w- it wasn't until college that I started to first question my foreign policy views. So I took a class on globalization in my freshman year, and we had to do a final paper on an organization that had arisen in response to some facet of globalization. Um, And so most people did things like fair trade or, or, you know, stuff along those lines. And me being the kind of neoliberal that I was at the time, (laughs) was like, globalization is awesome. So I'm going to choose like the most detestable organization I can think of. So I'm going to write about Al-Qaeda as a response to globalization. Okay. And my, (laughs) my original thesis was Um, Al-Qaeda arose in response to Americanization of the world um, and cultural spread of American values, right? That was Mm -hmm. my, like, thought. And then I actually started researching (laughs) and reading in their own words what they were about. And it's like, yes, this is still valid as a topic for my paper, but it has nothing to do with culture. It has nothing to do with American values. It has to do with American imperialism Mm -hmm. and learning more about the history of the United States and the Middle East going back to World War II really shook everything that I just had assumed and thought, which was basically that our our presence in the Middle East started because of 9-11 in response to this terrorist attack, which was not the case at all. Right. Year zero. Nothing <laughs> happened before 9-11. Yeah. Yeah. And I hadn't, you know, being the age that I was when that happened, the recent history in the Middle East before that wasn't being taught in school yet. Right. And the explanations that I heard about what had happened were largely from like Fox News and my parents and stuff like that. And so I just never even really knew that there was more to it than that. Mm. And so I had that world shaking sort of change in my views really on my own just from doing research my freshman year of college Um, and at the same time I also was losing my religion for various reasons and so I think I was just like open to radical worldview Mm -hmm. change at that time in my life I picked up a Ron Paul book the summer after my freshman year and he was still like he he was still anti-choice pro-life whatever you want to call it yeah so i i pretty much bought into ron paul's line on everything at that point when i was reading his books and then i decided i want to wanted to start my own libertarian group on campus because there Mm -hmm. wasn't one that was how i was introduced to students for liberty and young americans for liberty I started my campus YAL chapter, oh. <laughs> which I regret. Yeah. Sort of, but <laughs> we can talk about that too. But in that fall, I met an anarchist for the first time. I think I was just going to, like, I went to an SFL regional conference in New Orleans mm-hmm. and met an anarchist, um, Michael McCovey, okay. if you know him. He went to Loyola, where Walter Block is. Oh, sure, yeah. And so, and it's funny, actually, too, because when I told my dad I was getting into libertarianism, he's like, oh, you should go talk to Walter Block next door. (laughs) He knew what was up. Yeah. (laughs) So, anyway, Michael answered all of my, like, what if, what about, yada, yada questions about anarchism. And I was, like, very quickly converted to anarchism. Mm -hmm read for a new liberty was very convinced by that and then i read walter block stuff on abortion evictionism right i was trying to remember the word yep yeah and and that was like the last issue that i was not very libertarian on um and that convinced me and then i also just started to get really into feminism anyway so that now that's like an issue that's like extremely important to me on the opposite end Mm -hmm. so so yeah so that that probably like kind of completed that part of my evolution into being an anarchist and then i joined students for liberty that year and that was when i met corey Massimino, who listeners of the podcast may be familiar with. 
<laughs> um, and he introduced me to left libertarianism. Were you an ANCAP then, technically, before? Yeah. Self-proclaimed or just... Or I, I call myself a voluntarist. <laughs> yeah, that could have been okay. It's just the people, I mean... You know. Oh, that was before I mean, everyone cool. who was like an ANCAP and a voluntarist became awful. Yeah. I mean, like, it was, they were like <laughs> secretly awful, at least. Not, like, it's a nice so sounding open. term. I mean, there's nothing objectionable. Yeah, anything in, voluntary. In that. Yeah. <laughs> that well, sounds that's... great. Yep. <laughs> but he wrote... So actually, the way I met him is because he, he wrote an article in response to something that Walter had written back in 2014, and it was just talking about thick libertarianism versus thin libertarianism right. and how a libertarian commitment to freedom, right, has to also involve this commitment um, to human flourishing in general and like tearing down these other systems of oppression that are just as relevant as the state, even if they're not as like obviously like present or institutionalized in the same way that they're also extreme they're also important so i i read that article and i liked it so much that i sent him a message on facebook even though we'd never really talked to each other before even we met in person like one time for like 30 seconds mm -hmm. before that but i was like i love your article and then we started talking every day and now we're married and so <laughs> <laughs> i'd go sometimes yeah <laughs> should have invited walter block to the wedding i guess <laughs> i don't know if you give him credit or not maybe oh not man <laughs> So maybe a little bit of indirect, indirect credit. He's a lot nicer than you would think, actually, too, because I've met him several <laughs> times. And, oh, my gosh. There's, so one time, this is a tangent, but one time, so I was added to his email list. And then the, one of the worst ones, I don't even want to say his name, on the list, respond, replied all and is basically like, Kelly is a feminist and isn't a real anarchist and she shouldn't be on this list. And then Dan D'Amico actually responded in defense of me. He always seemed pretty good. Yeah, um, he has like his moments, but that was very nice of him, mm -hmm. even though we disagreed. But he he responded defending me. And then Walter invited me and the other guy to his office to like reconcile. <laughs> And I was like, this is so dumb, but it, Walter Block <laughs> invited me to his office, so I'm going to go. And I went, and the other guy never showed up, and me and Walter just sat in his office for a little bit and, like, awkwardly talked, and he offered me a cough drop, like, five times. That's kind of <laughs> cute. I like that. It was cute. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I, I guess I never met him. I did, um, I was, like, the moderator when he did a debate with, um... Oh my gosh, the late Tommy Raskin? Is that his name? It was on Animal Rights. Um, oh, nice. And Block was, you know, you might you might expect his position, like the, you know. <laughs> but it wasn't like we, you know, there's nothing wrong with beating a dog up. It's just you know that there's no, I don't know. It was yeah, the classic Walter Block opinion. Yeah. It's it's actually amazing that he's that he has a good opinion on abortion, given so many of his other <laughs> opinions <laughs> so he just dropped a contrarian um covid thing which Ugh. i was showing to Corey actually and he thought it was too far in kind of the other direction which may be true but at least it wasn't sort of the the official line now of like i don't know i don't know i'm gonna go uh, sneeze on everybody to check it out yeah <laughs> Ugh. Yeah. Um, so that was that was a time <laughs> where, in terms of what I am now, I think individualist anarcho-feminist is accurate. Mm -hmm. um, I still have a lot of my sort of object objectivist roots that have carried through, but in an anarchist feminist kind of way. There's something about a sprinkle of Ayn Rand, just a sprinkle that has made some very legit people. Um, and yeah. like, I always thought Corey was a little soft on her too. I want to poke at that just because as much as she was obviously a strong woman, you know, um, and a certainly an individual, 
Um, even in the anthem, which is, you know, one of the shorter ones, the only ones I've gotten through, at the end, there's this weird anti-feminist sort of attitude. So, like, I don't know if you, f- do you find her to be feminist at all, or do you just pick out the, the um, stuff she should I have think said? It's- complicated i think that she had a very weird relationship with gender in general um like she she took being mistaken for a man as a compliment um she had a lot of really gendered assumptions about men and women Mm -hmm. that she didn't conform to um and i think that her anti-feminist rants are super misguided and come from this I I just don't think she was very good in general at being charitable about other people's views yeah um or trying to understand them outside of her own kind of preconceptions and so I I think that like if you actually read between the lines I think that there's a lot of feminism in her works but there's also a lot of stuff that's really cringe and then when she Mm -hmm. actually directly addresses it it's super cringe (laughs) (laughs) the ending of anthem 90 pages of totally fine totally good at the end our our narrator he you know he learns the word i and i think he names himself and the non-existent female like lady friend she's like oh your name's well what's my name honey and like your name's you know, Rosemary, whatever the hell it is, like, it undermines the whole thing in just like a, you know, like a sentence of like, sure, I name you, you know? I, I actually I don't know. haven't read Anthem. Um, the well, two... Spoiler alert, I guess. Yeah, no, that's fine. <laughs> it's very frustrating. It's, 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 <laughs> one, it's like literally a sentence or two, you know? Yeah. Yeah, I've I've read Atlas Shrugged and We the We the Living. We the Living is my favorite. I've meant to read that actually. Yeah. Yeah, that's really good. Both of those have female protagonists as the main characters, mm. um, which I think are both self inserts to some extent <laughs> um, in both of those. But maybe that makes it a little bit more digestible than some of the others where. It's like an idealized man, you know, the perfect yeah. man character that she was always looking for. Yeah, and like they still have, like, well, not not in We the Living, but Atlas Shrugged, of course, still has the idealized man um, in John Gold. Mm-hmm. But um, We the Living is really cool because the two men in the main character's life are both flawed, um, like very flawed in different ways. Um, you have the communist character who is like has like a good heart but his political alliances have sort of gotten in the way of that Mm -hmm. and then you have the sort of capitalist character who's a dick and like antisocial and like i don't i don't think he's much likable at all i Mm -hmm. um and i don't think he's really supposed to be um so that but that one's much more interesting it's funny it's her first book but i think it's probably her best in terms of the complexity of the characters and she's interesting yeah (laughs) not that it's like you know your earlier politics are necessarily opposed to feminism but you know people might assume they are so how did you find feminism itself in a particular it's weird it's like hard for me to trace exactly um i think i always so i i never was like a traditionalist about anything Mm -hmm. um i've always had a rebellious streak um you know my mom has a phd and like both my parents were working when i was younger um i never viewed myself as as being a sort of traditional housewife or or anything along those lines um i think having like the the having my view of abortion challenged um and and getting past that roadblock i think broke down maybe the barrier between me and and feminism um okay. where i would have been there naturally anyway um and then since i got past that i have really enjoyed reading a lot of feminist work um 
Andrea Dworkin and Mary Daly and stuff like that um, that is really radical and interesting. Um, not always non-problematic either because mm-hmm, sure. they have the turf strand that kind of runs through some of their work. Um, but I think just in general, as I started to understand um institutionalized racism and sexism and ableism and all of those things like I think that just kind of comprehensive shift in my worldview um mapped on well with that and 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 then reading a lot of the like the feminist literature and stuff like that made that issue maybe more central to me um because I think that you know, there's there's different arguments in terms of where where all of these isms come from and and how they interrelate. Mm-hmm. But I I do think it's important to think about um, feminism or sexism and patriarchy is one that transcends cultural barriers, time barriers. It's one that's always been there in all kinds of systems of government, um, in places where there's only one race or in places where there's lots of races. Um, you know, so it, it, to me, like, I think a lot of the things that we think about in terms of institutional oppression, um, feminism can, and feminist analysis can open up like a, a window of understanding into that that's that's broadly applicable mm-hmm. i imagine you notice that um libertarian circles aren't super you definitely noticed amenable to feminism <laughs> that was the other thing was just like the disgusting level of sexism that i was exposed to coming into libertarianism it's yeah. like there are people that believe this shit like seriously like I- Ugh. I never found I was never directly encountering as much sexism but the sheer number of people who were completely opposed to just a whisper of the word feminism was also very strange people who still yeah. argue that it's literally anathema like they don't you know are the, yeah. the same people that are now arguing that like if you're trans somehow that's inherently like I don't know Maoist or <laughs> <laughs> That's just Jordan Peterson. Um, but yeah, yeah, there's there's this very, there's a fake, you know, conflict there when these things go together as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> yeah, I agree. I agree. And I think like the, op- the opposition that I ever had to feminism beyond the abortion issue was this assumption that feminists want to use the state right, to right. force equality. Um or force equal outcomes Mm -hmm. and that is detrimental i still think that's detrimental i just don't think that's what feminism is or is about or has to be about um and i think that anarchism and feminism go hand in hand and are made better by each other i don't know enough about emma goldman still oh she's just got some of the best like feminist stuff um Mm -hmm. like early feminist stuff um about love she writes um is it love and marriage something like that marriage and love marriage and love yeah yeah that piece is great it's a huge influence on my piece on um egoism and love and anarchism um but she writes that marriage and love have nothing in common and are as far far apart as possible and of course the context in which she's writing this is is different oh yeah (laughs) Um, (laughs) like I'm happily married but that was a very different context to become married in (laughs) absolutely (laughs) than what she's writing about yeah so she just I I love her stuff I think she she comes across as so radical and so modern it's like amazing to think about her writing these things back then and like the life that she lived is so interesting and um she's just cool can you talk a little about your, your essay, your your love essay that I, I read today and I enjoyed? And I will say, to me, a lot of it reads as I, like the way I kind of wish Ayn Rand came off, which is like, you know, about the self without being sort of 
a self parody if that makes sense yeah yeah i think um so my my essay the anarchist and the egoist in love um it was in response to the, to the mutual exchange prompt or symposium on anarchism and egoism um as the relationship between these two ideas is super contentious um and has been forever how can someone be committed to the well-being of others and also be an egoist be committed to themselves Mm -hmm. and their own flourishing and their own well-being and so what i'm doing is basically taking those two ideas and looking at where i think the most obvious place where they intersect is is in love we hear about love and and are and grow up being taught that love is selfless and requires self-sacrifice and i think it's important to differentiate between self-sacrifice and compromise when you love someone and ayn rand wrote great things about love i quote her several times actually um you fall in love with someone's values and falling in love with those values it's a reflection of yourself and your own values and i think that in loving someone else we become better people and self-actualize and in order to truly love someone else we can't submit ourselves like like loving isn't submission or it isn't like taking yourself and and putting it under the whims of someone else it's not being a trad wife (laughs) yeah yeah it's like um you know viewing the other person as an end in themselves and them viewing you as an end in yourself like i think that's a necessary precondition for love Mm -hmm. um real love not this bs version of love that we have pushed on us through religion through rom-coms through (laughs) a million other things but love is mutual and shared and comes from the the actualization of two people together and so that's kind of what i'm what i'm doing there and and i think it, it requires that egoism which is that you know being true to yourself and and your values and demanding to have your that self be respected um and then anarchism doing for that that for the other person mm-hmm. respecting their boundaries and respecting their values and when you compromise and love it's not you're not like forsaking your values you're valuing the other person and what you share and deciding like w- like you're arranging your values in in context but you're not like subverting them to the other person and it's a two-way street so that's basically the recap (laughs) i mean that's good i'm i read too much about like fundamentalist christianity lately and like trad wife stuff so i mean they're all about well i choose to be subservient and my husband loves me like uh Christ loves the church and all that sort of thing but yeah (laughs) it makes me cringe because because I I do think it has to be mutual it has to come from this place of mutual respect and well I think some of them claim that they are you know I respect him as my head and he respects me as the helper who (laughs) does the lady stuff and we're (laughs) we're equal in our worth but obviously not in our value or our decision making abilities or our leadership i mean yeah it's stuff it's stuff like that and 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 that's not to say like everyone has their strengths and has their mm-hmm. weaknesses but to assume that those are divided along lines of gender and and like it are somehow innate and applicable to all people everywhere um you know if if one person really wants to be like a housewife or something Mm -hmm. like I don't necessarily have a problem with that it's when like it goes from that to the need to make these broader claims about like the nature of womanhood and Mm -hmm. household management and like every house has a division of labor but the idea that that division of labor would like need to be based on gender is just totally absurd 
if Corey and I were to do that, it would be a disaster. <laughs> and he's a, he's a better at a lot of the things um, around the house, you know, that, that I might have to do in that world. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I, I'm doing pretty well professionally and I'm happy and he's happy. So it's just absurd to like, even, I don't, I don't, I don't get it. Honestly. I think that, you don't want your personal life and your politics to be totally in conflict and that you don't want to be like acting totally out of your values. But people then I think take like whatever personal preference that they have and feel the need to universalize it to everyone else. Mm -hmm. And that's where the trad wife stuff is like. Maybe you and I are trying to universalize this to everyone too, that you, I don't know, you know, but yeah, but, but, well, and that's why I said, like, like if someone wants to be a traditional housewife, like, f- fine. I, like, I don't really care. as long, If you're genuinely happy that way, and both of you are genuinely happy that way, and you feel fulfilled in your life, and then, like, great, good for you. But, like, don't then turn around and, and A, teach your children that that's how it has to be, mm-hmm. and B try to politicize it and tell everyone else that that is how it has to be like it just doesn't make any sense and it's just so in denial of like human nature and the the human soul like everyone has different strengths and different weaknesses and the idea that like one characteristic of someone their gender or their sex or whatever um which is really an amalgamation of a lot of different characteristics that we put mm-hmm. a, a name on. Um, and that is a very flexible <laughs> categorization. Anyway, the idea that that could um, predestine you to be like better at these chores, like it's just so yeah, ridiculous. Chores of all things. The more you think about it, it's it so ridiculous. <laughs> yeah. There's another, I'm going to, I hate when people read my words, but uh, at me, but I'm going to do this to you in the essay. You have a a sentence says beyond the promise of an afterlife, cheapening life on earth. If God can show his love for humanity by sacrificing his son, it's no great leap to think Christians can show their love for God by sacrificing others to his glory. I was very intrigued and I liked, I liked that. I thought that was, Christopher Hitchensy in like the best sense of the word, which <laughs> thank you. <laughs> I think he, he had his moments, even though he was a bit of a disaster. Um, yeah. But in short, so religion is that a no for you in terms of, or just in the organized? Yeah. Well, I think I think it depends on the content of the religion. I think I'm not opposed to something transcendent. I think. Mary Daly's work, um, Beyond God the Father, is a really good exploration of the idea of transcendence outside of religion. That's an amazing book. Highly recommend it. I want to put a content warning for like a little bit of turfiness in there, Mm. though. But that's not like the core of the book at all. But anyway, Beyond God the Father talks about transcendence and the idea that we all want to like connect to something bigger than ourselves or outside of ourselves. And I think that religion is an attempt to do that. And I don't look down on the idea of religion necessarily. I don't know what I believe factually. I don't think that I have access to knowledge to conclude on one way or the other but i think that most religions are pretty clearly man-made pretty clearly have this mythology that doesn't really have any like basis and then at its worst like in the in the passage that i'm talking about there like just actively teaches bad values that cheapen human life Mm -hmm. and i don't think you can live your life under the assumption that there's anything else after that and to do that I think is selling yourself short it's undervaluing yourself it's undervaluing your your time and also that of the people around you and your community and I I don't think it's any coincidence that 
Christians often have political views that seem so hateful towards other people and so out of line with some of the really nice things that you read in the Bible. Um, it's not like the Bible's all terrible. Right. Although I do think it's worse than some people would <laughs> like to think. Like, yeah, <laughs> to be clear, there's probably. a lot of, like, fucked up stuff in the Bible. <laughs> like, <laughs> but um, I, if, you, if you live with this idea that we're just here on our way somewhere else, I think you take this life for granted and live a worse life and make other people's lives worse, too, whether that's killing them for a crusade and and the most extreme version um you know passing laws that outlaw people's expression of their self um or shaming people it doesn't have to just be like violent or law-based it's it can be just you know shame and stigmatization and ostracization and all things like that so religion gives people a way to do that and still feel good about themselves (laughs) every time i want to totally toss it out though there's always like the coolest old peace activist that you've you know maybe never heard of is they're always like a catholic like there's always there's some really good people who have some ties to religion that i find slightly baffling but i also think god you're doing better you know for the world than i am so i'm not gonna critique you too hard yeah it's not like everyone who's religious is uh, like making other people's lives worse or something like that and there there's lots that are making people's lives better um and i and of course there's a lot of variety within religion i mean Corey and I used to go to a Quaker meeting house when we lived in um, Houston. Like, Gotta like the Quakers, at least. Yeah. Well, besides Nixon, I guess not that not the conservative ones. There's. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know he was a Quaker. Wow. He was. There's like a whole. This is like Western Quakers. There's something where I, it was baffling to find out that Nixon was a Quaker, and they they're just like a, almost a whole different deal. But they're still called Quakers. But that explains wow, why he that's was so wild. terrible. <laughs> that's wild still a bad legacy for the word quaker <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah well and i feel like half the people at the meeting house didn't weren't even really christian like mm-hmm. people would just go and and sit in silence and the building that it was in was really cool it had a roof that opened up to the sky um like just full open air like they would pull mm-hmm. it back and we'd sit in there at eight in the morning there were like maybe 10 other people and we all just sit there for an hour in silence and mm-hmm. uh, i i never heard god talk to me yet, but i felt pretty great um yeah. <laughs> and it was a nice little community so i think the the best part probably of religion is the community and that's something that is hard to like, I don't know that there are great secular replacements for that at this point, because that was something that, you know, moving a bunch when I was a kid or, and changing schools and changing interests and stuff. Like, the only person basically from middle school that I'm still friends with was someone who went to church with me because we saw each other every single week, no matter what, mm-hmm. no matter what other activities we were doing, no matter what classes we were in, whatever, like that's the the plus side is the community I suppose that can also be the downside too though yes that's where the shame and the ostracization and the all of that stuff comes from yeah or even like um the values that i i like like you know serving on the mount stuff cheek turning and all that that i always thought was pretty moving Mm -hmm. i realized can be kind of ruined by these contexts like Duggar style quiverful Christianity where like um forgiveness is basically mandatory. So like it, yeah. it, it has no more significance because it, you have to, because yeah, I read, I read too much about Duggar. So it's like, <laughs> but, yeah, but yeah. Even that can be ruined by just the, like, well, you have, you have to, that's your, you know, that's your sibling. You have to forgive them because. Like, yeah. Yeah, definitely. I think it's good to on the forgiveness note, that is something I feel like I've retained from Christianity. Not the not the, the obligation to forgive, mm. but my understanding of forgiveness. Because for me, I think forgiveness is more about 
like you more about you than it is about the other person it's not something that you're giving to the other person it's something that really you're giving to yourself which is the permission to move on Mm -hmm. um not to forget but to not let them not let it continue to hurt you and obviously in situations of abuse that's a process that for one thing there's never any need to reach out to the other person and tell them that you forgive them. Um, But that, but also that's a process that can take years and years and years. And I think is really more of like a therapeutic process and an internal process, not anything to be done out of obligation. So, yeah, I mean, I think Christianity's well, even within just mainline Christianity, there's so many different interpretations of what that even means to turn the other cheek or to, Mm -hmm. to forgive And it can have really awful applications. Yeah. Uh, Other things you've written about, I've noticed that I find very interesting is stuff about both involuntary commitment and being against that in the mental health sense. um, And probably the other sense too. And also the idea that the mentally ill should have guns slash methods of self-defense. So Even though, let's see, I looked this up. Something like a fifth of people in the U.S. have a mental illness. Um, 5% have a severe one. And there are almost 400 million guns in the U.S., which is one reason why gun control, if for that reason alone, ain't going to happen, kids. Um, (laughs) But can you tell, like, there's a thousand decent people who would immediately flinch if you said, let's arm the mentally ill. I mean, yeah. So arm the mentally ill, I wrote in response to the default sort of argument after any time there's a mass shooting, Mm -hmm. which is, is it like, do we need more gun control or do we need to like, put mentally ill people behind bars <laughs> you're like this that's, that's like like you have republicans saying oh this is a mental health problem and and you have democrats saying like we need to have gun control and you have lots of people saying both or saying specifically people with mental illness need to not have access to guns mm-hmm. and the title is supposed to be as provocative as possible i think arm the mentally ill but it's a it's a response to this phenomenon which just pisses me off to no end which is a like you said lots of people have mental illness Mm -hmm. right the idea that people who are mentally ill kill people is so toxic and so wrong the idea that people who are mentally ill don't deserve to have the same rights as everyone else is toxic and wrong and also people who are mentally ill are more likely to be the victims of gun violence than they are to be the perpetrators or of any violence um not just gun violence and so the de- the whole debate around gun control and around mass shootings is broken. Mm-hmm. I also am firmly against gun control anyway. Um, there are a lot of reasons for that. The main one is that to do so requires violence. Whether you do it on the sell side or you go and round up guns now, it doesn't matter. Like it's, It requires violent enforcement. It creates black markets it is not going to accomplish what it proposes to accomplish and it's going to hurt innocent people and put innocent people behind bars in the meantime. Yep. And then to target mentally ill people. I mean, I'm, I'm someone who has had different diagnoses in my life. I was finally recognized as having ADHD when I was 22 or 21, something like that. Um, Before that, I had been diagnosed with bipolar disorder. I had been diagnosed with depression. I had been diagnosed with anxiety, like all of these other things that were really symptoms of ADHD. Okay. And the idea that, for one thing, that mental illness is something that is so easily categorizable like you either have it or you don't and it never changes or whatever it 
lacks understanding of how it actually works. And then, yeah, just assuming that <laughs> that you can identify the people that who will kill a bunch of people before it happens or will commit a crime before it happens, that has horrible potential waterfall effects that go way beyond mental health. <laughs> if you've seen uh, Captain America, Winter Soldier, it's all about that. Yeah. <laughs> they try to like use an algorithm to pinpoint who's going, who's most likely to be subversive or, or whatever and, and take them out. People are very convinced that that's possible. And I think that mainstream liberals are probably the worst offenders in, in a lot of ways in that attitude. I mean, or like, I, I remember the, um, the South Carolina church shooting, uh, Dylan Roofs. I don't I hate to drop his stupid name. Um, mm -hmm. You know, he had like a pot charge a little before that. And I remember when that happened, people were like, oh, if only we had thrown him in, you know, jail for a long time. He wouldn't have shot up the church. I'm like, yeah, maybe, but that's not the way, to, you know, that's a yeah. the magical thinking type thing. Like we could have, you know, done yeah, the equations it, and predicted the future. It's absolutely ridiculous. I think that anytime people feel um, powerless, they have this unfortunate tendency to try to control um, mm -hmm. everything around them and look to the state to do that and don't think about any of the potential consequences of doing that and yeah that that's a perfect example of like like okay you do that with him and then who else and then how mm -hmm. many of those people actually would have gone on to commit a violent crime and how many of them are more likely to commit a crime now that they, like once they get out of jail than they right. would have been what are you learning you in jail i mean alone? Yeah. right like there's a reason that there's so many repeat offenders because you you take away people's ability to make a living for themselves and have a life and they don't have anything else to to turn to it'd be nice to think that we could just fix all of these things ahead of time but do we really trust the do we really trust the government to do that is that even possible no no, no. yeah and it's absurd to think that it is. And also it's absurd to think that it wouldn't be massively abused intentionally by people. Like we're, t we're talking about a world that's trying to treat trans people like they have a mental illness automatically. Right. We have a long history in this country of treating political dissidents, um, people of color as having mental illness as a way to keep them quiet and shut them down and that's a good segue into my involuntary commitment article which talks about that as well you handle the segues you know, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know and and that one is just against this this idea of treating mental illness as a crime and so it's the same kind of the same concept the, the same types of assumptions that we can stop people from committing a crime beforehand or that thinking differently on its own just is a crime. Mm -hmm. Involuntary commitment is really terrible, um, both on principle and in terms of its outcomes. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have good mental health outcomes for people. Um, I talk about this a lot in that article where I, I had the, that's the closest thing to like investigative journalism I've ever done because I actually interviewed people who had been committed. I saw that, yeah. And, you know, what their experiences were like. And, it's scary to read that. Yeah. Yeah. Terrifying. And and they, you don't have to have a warrant or have any evidence of you having done anything wrong. You're, someone, a family member, a friend, a teacher, whatever, just calls the cops and says that you're going to kill yourself. And now you go to jail. Mm -hmm. And... Do we think that that is a context in which someone is going to actually make good progress on their mental health? Like, absolutely not. People who are suffering from mental health issues are often dealing with isolation and loneliness and a lack of trust of people around them. And one way to make that a million times worse is for their family and friends to send them to jail. Because <laughs> that's what that is. I mean, 
<laughs> yeah. And you can't force someone to participate in therapy and to do the work of improving their mental health. And it sucks. You know, I, I have had significant mental health, like I've had family members with significant mental health issues. And it's really hard to go through that as someone who loves that person and to not be able to do anything about it. But if you're someone who loves that person, then you should know that committing them involuntarily is not going to accomplish what you want it to accomplish. I, even if you feel power, like you may feel powerless and you may feel like you have no other options, but doing nothing is better than doing that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's, that's a hard thing for people to accept, I think. It is. And, and understandably so. And you, you care about someone, you see them struggling and you see them not not going to therapy, not taking their meds, not doing whatever things like you can encourage them, you can support them, you can try to be there for them, but sending them off to a hospital to be, to be committed and these places are often more like prisons than hospitals is not going like the, the best possible short-term outcome is they're forced to take some kind of medication that stabilizes some or extreme prevented thing right for like one day you know the moment yeah. for, from hurting themselves yeah exactly very very short term um with potentially devastating long-term consequences that can significantly worsen the mental health issues that they're sent for in the first place so so I was reading about Thomas Saws while I was reading his Wikipedia page, admittedly, today. Um, do you know about him, I assume? Yeah, a bit. A bit. I feel like um, he was maybe a little too far in the uh, sort of the mental illness sort of doesn't exist unless yeah. it's like a brain, you know, I don't know, a tumor or something causing. And that seems sort of unhelpful, but his principle, he, had, he was extremely against involuntary commitment so much so that he apparently worked with Scientologists about it which is kind of funny because Scientologists have therapy they just black can blackmail you about it later that's their whole thing um, <laughs> yeah they also involuntarily <laughs> commit their own people they do don't they their, uh, that's a really good point centers <laughs> <laughs> that is a good point <laughs> I'm getting the sense that more people are kind of more and more people are aware that if your um, friend or family is having a mental health crisis, don't call the cops on mm -hmm. them. And I'd say that's a certain amount of progress because that means they're not going to get immediately shot, you know. But I talked to uh, Miriam Kaba about this a little bit, where this is sort of, um, you know, even if you have a hotline where a social worker shows up that can still lead to this almost the exact same level of coercive, as you said. I mean, it's, it's like being sent to jail with arguably fewer standards for um, how long they can keep you there. So I don't know if you can imagine an anarchist world where we deal with these things um, in a way that, you know, I'm not, even I'm not satisfied with the idea that, you know, obviously, like, someone you love says they're going to kill themselves, and you're like, well, that's your, phil philosophically, I'm, you know, <laughs> you have that right. I'm like, yes, but in, 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 in practice, that's not what you're going to say, you know, and certainly people who feel suicidal can get in, you know, not to be, not scientific about it, but, um, like, in a fugue state sort of thing, and, like, later they're glad that they didn't, there are moments where they're not, they're not someone with cancer making a decision. It's not, you know, Yeah. I don't know. I just like, there are these things that, that, that pick at the philosophical um, issues a little bit. Um, yeah. Um, but I think to some extent there, you know, there are other interventions that you can try um, in that context that aren't committing someone. So like, but the example of someone who's in a fugue state feeling suicidal is is if you can and this isn't always possible but if you can just to sit with that person and mm -hmm. to just be there with them and you don't have to say anything you don't have to force them to talk to you you can just be present with that person watch tv with them do something like that you know if they literally have a gun in their hand like I think that's a little bit of a different situation um, in terms of 
if you're present in that situation, you also have to like protect your own life. And so I think that to the extent that violence is self-defensive, there's a, there's a certain amount that's justified just to make the situation safe again. Right. Um, but I think that like really the, the best solution to mental health is not the easiest one, which is yeah. more proactive, <laughs> mm-hmm. like in general, just destigmatizing mental health issues, reaching out to friends and spending time with them and to family members and spending time with them, being emotionally intuitive mm-hmm. and, and paying attention to the people that you care about. Or if you see people that are struggling and isolated, making yourself present and being being there in their lives and that doesn't always work and you can't save everyone and that's really hard to accept and that yeah. they're, and it sucks but I think before you go the commitment route you have to ask yourself a like what are the potential consequences of doing this and the downsides of doing this is this person ever going to trust me again? How much I, more isolated is this person going to be after I have done this? And like, is there anything that I can do other, other than that just to be there with them? Because I think that most people, when when they get to that point, it's a, a, out of a feeling of isolation and feeling like nobody would care or like it would be easier to just get it to just get it over with and, it, and it's very much like like it like helping them I think helping people rediscover things that are worth living for whether that's like human connection or something that they're passionate about stuff like that I think that, that is harder than just calling the cops right. but it's the only thing that's going to work so I don't know if there's like an easy answer there. I mean, there isn't, but um, I just wish more people knew, like even with a social worker, like involuntary commitment is is involuntary commitment and it doesn't have the mental health outcomes that people think that or hope that it will have. I mean, I guess some people think of it in terms of, you know, it's a medical intervention. It's not really about their mental health at all. It's like, we're doing whatever will keep them alive as if they were, you know, had lost a leg and were hemorrhaging or something. And that's as far as it takes them, I think in a lot of ways. Yeah. And I, and I do think, you know, in terms of just making medical decisions for other people, that, that is a whole, um, (laughs) that's a difficult issue all on its own. And when you're talking about, people's right to die and stuff like that that's already something that's not respected legally or medically that should be and as hard as it can be to stomach like ultimately that person's decision is their decision and I don't know (laughs) yeah that's a philosophically very in favor of right to die I think in practice I'm not going to blame people for certain things to try to stop that you know right from being carried out but obviously the status quo is is both indefensible on principle and my god how obvious is it that the incentive is to not tell a therapist the truth to not tell people how you're actually right feeling. right very... i mean then that's the biggest thing like <laughs> like you can't even trust your therapist because they have to to call the cops on you i mean that's crazy that's what's crazy. Yeah. <laughs> Not any one person. It's so backwards. It's like, you know, surely keeping uh, prostitution illegal or and drugs illegal will keep people safer. I mean, it's so clear to me that it's hard for me to communicate to people who don't understand this at this point. That's just like, no, it's, you know. The incentives are the opposite. It's hidden. You're, you know, you're not sharing that you're in danger or that you're feeling bad or something. Yeah. Yeah, Yeah, I agree. Similarly, I guess I was thinking of back to the firearms and mental illness thing. Like, um, 
you know, when the, the, the mainstream discourse on guns is usually about, well, a mass shooting usually, but, you know, homicide in general and suicide is a lot more common of a use of guns. Um, so yeah. like, <laughs> and I think some mentally ill people actually deliberately don't have guns in their house for this reason. Um, and like, I don't know, I'm trying to avoid having like the most, like whenever prison reform comes up, I I have to bring up Jeffrey Dahmer. And like, when it comes to mental illness, I have to bring up the most unstable or like the, the person with the most severe hallucinations possible. And these things are, um, you know, they're very uncommon. So I don't know why I have this urge to do this, but I know other people do as well. I think it's, yeah, I think it's a natural urge to try to bring up like the most extreme example um it's unfortunate that that i think that extreme example is how people justify these big blanket rules that apply to everyone Mm -hmm. i think in the case of someone like jeffrey dahmer where there's really not a way to ensure the safety of other people without having that person be separated from other people to sure, some extent that way. yeah there's still i think humane ways to do that and it's 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 hard for that to feel fair um mm-hmm. when you're the family member of a victim i think we all have this like revenge instinct like somewhere mm-hmm. in inside of us but i think that something you know like house rest or something like that is much more reasonable for someone like that than prison Mm -hmm. and I am a prison abolitionist in general I don't I don't support prisons in general but I think that like there may be those extreme fringe cases where separation from society is necessary and is makes and makes sense but I don't think it has to be done in prison and I and I think that this is where I think egoism comes back into the way I like sort out a lot of of these anarchist issues is that for a prison to exist, someone has to be the prison guard. Mm -hmm. I think the act of dehumanizing someone else is extremely dehumanizing. It seems that way. That's for sure. Yeah. Yeah. And, and do we want our systems to be those that give power to people like that or put people in the position of executioner of prison guard i think that's like committing a crime against that person too in a sense Mm -hmm. even if they sign up for it whatever Mm -hmm. even if they don't really know that or understand that yeah yeah like damaging them as well yeah yeah and so there are ways to address those fringe issues without creating an institution of power that's corrupting for the people in in it on both sides, then I prefer that alternative. (laughs) I mean, I think we have to accept more uncomfortableness and I wouldn't be immune to it either, but, um, you know, uh, ignoring the complete bullshit, moral panic, groomer, et cetera thing, the, 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 the slightly more coherent sounding, uh, you know, certain people are trying to normalize say pedophilia is a thing that I I have seen a lot lately and things in terms of, you know, mental health things, either talking homicidal things like, like Jeffrey Dahmer types or pedophilic urges. I almost feel like we need a resource where these awful urges can be discussed with someone and there's not a disincentive to speak about them because how could that be any worse than the way it's set up now, you know? Yeah, yeah. And I think something like voluntary rehabilitation centers are totally valid. Um, You know, if someone wants to commit themselves into something, as long as they have a right of exit Mm -hmm. at any time, then... I mean, like a hospital most of the time. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. (laughs) They have their problems too, but like if you have a physical medical problem, in theory, you can go get that checked on. I mean... Yeah, yeah. Or a chronic one, I guess, which is a little Exactly. And I I think that therapy and and stuff like that is most effective when there's trust between Mm -hmm. the person who's receiving the therapy and the therapist. And 
a vol like the only way to create that I think is voluntarily. So I think stuff like that can be very effective if it's voluntary. Mm. If only people weren't so scared of that. <laughs> Not to not to quote David Bowes of all people, but in his sort of generic libertarian book, I remember he had a thing about how you don't set up whole systems and societies and rules based on a lifeboat scenario. So you know, you know, property rights are nice, but if someone is literally starving and they takes an apple from someone's property, like it's not that doesn't say anything about that really, except that they were, you know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, I like um, you know, the idea of proportionality when it comes to stuff like that kind of underrated important critical right like stereotypical libertarians kind of ignore that a lot you know yeah and it's unfortunate that the people get so bent on rules or or the sort of consequentialist outcome like i think when people talk about moral morality in general it's very tempting to come up with rules because they're easy to communicate Mm -hmm. whereas proportionality is much more of like a sort of virtue ethics kind of contextualized application of those rules but that's really the only kind that works i think in in reality but yeah is it proportional to be violent towards someone for stealing an apple off of your property when they're like on the verge of death or honestly even if they're not if it's an apple it would still be proportionally insane yeah and the reason you can kill somebody who breaks into your house as much as again property rights should be a thing (laughs) but the reason that you could kill them is not because you know they might take your computer so much as you know they're into space and you don't know what their intentions are and it's fundamentally a violation to be in your space like that right and you don't necessarily have time to safely figure out what their intentions are Mm -hmm. (laughs) if you wait to try to figure out in that context you might lose your chance to defend yourself yeah i guess i should start giving people warnings about this to ask for like either three books or even any movies or anything like that three pieces of media that you know were influential slash or that you recommend to people sort of Ooh. So. Oh, I, I like that. Okay, let's see. Um, well, I'm going to tell people if they haven't read any Ayn Rand or if they have and didn't like it um, to read We the Living. I'm literally going to take you up on that. So it's that's really one. good. Um, it's really good. It's really interesting. It's sad. Um, it's the only one that's kind of like has a historical fiction bent to Mm -hmm. it and yeah i I really liked it in terms of movies i have a million recommendations i'm on letterboxd kelly vk just the letters vk i think i follow you on letterboxd i'm pretty sure (laughs) i do yes (laughs) awesome awesome my favorite movies are thelma and louise portrait of a lady on fire wild strawberries and 2001 i'm going to talk about wild strawberries because that's probably the least likely for people to have seen wild strawberries is a fantastic film from the 1950s from sweden uh the director is ingmar bergman um, who's better known for like fanny fanny and alexander and persona but this was his chance to direct his own childhood hero um victor sostrom who is a a silent film director from sweden and he plays the main character in this movie um and it's the last role that he was ever in he he died shortly after the movie was made and he plays an aging man who he's he's like maybe in his 80s he's traveling to accept like an award from a university for lifetime achievement kind of thing and as he's traveling, he meets a group of younger people that remind him of his childhood sweetheart. And you kind of travel back and forth between his memories and his dreams and his actual, what, what he's actually doing. Um, and so it explores this kind of fear of death and, and longing for our childhoods and and the way that we put this kind of rose-colored glasses on when we're looking back at our childhood and at our past. Um, it talks about regret and fulfillment and 
the misconceptions we have about age that, you know, at some point we all figure it out um, when really no one ever figures it out. <laughs> oh, no. Yeah. So it's, <laughs> it's just a really beautiful movie and it's a, a lot more uplifting than it sounds. Mm-hmm. Um, no, it's, it's sad too, but really, really, really good. Yeah. I can't and, say I've ever seen that or any Bergman or any f- 50s Swedish movies probably seen a Swedish movie I've definitely seen a 50s movie but not all three so it's yeah it's great I love it and then favorite like my third and third favorite thing let's see I'll go with like a music or something so very well rounded I like I like what you're doing here makes sense um my favorite song is Rush Spirit of the Radio but for something that people are less likely to have heard Kesha's comeback album Rainbow that came out a few years ago. Oh yeah. I love it. I listen to it all the way through frequently. <laughs> I can't say I've heard her beyond sort of when she first arrived in the singles, but then, you know, hopefully we all started rooting for her in a personal sense um after yes. her difficulties, but I don't, you know, I don't know her music. Yeah, what what's great with that album is it has a lot of variety she is given a chance to explore different genres which she never did in her old music which Mm. is all club music and there's a lot of really personal stuff in there there's goofy stuff in there there's cute stuff good love songs she's got a good voice Mm -hmm. so i just like that one puts me in a good mood that's good i need more good mood music probably yeah now that some songs will not put you in a good mood, like the one that directly addresses what happened to her. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but but it'll put you in a good mood that she's overcoming it. That's, That's good. Yeah. <laughs> We're all rooting for Kesha, or should be. Yes. Um, as I have run out of my coffee, so I must ask you the traditional non-Serbian question, which is, how would I get a cappuccino in your political utopia? Wow, in my political <laughs> utopia. And it has to be me, I guess, because in case the other person doesn't want coffee, it has to be something that I desire, you know, something that's, well. Well, I would think that you could buy one. <laughs> that's the ideal. It's the sim- no one ever answers that, I swear to God. <laughs> for barter, for gold coins, just for um, you know, free banking. Yeah, uh, for whatever people feel like, <laughs> whatever people gravitate towards. <laughs> currently, I don't think crypto is there because people are so speculative yeah, in how they true. deal with it. But maybe it'll be crypto. Maybe it'll be gold. Maybe it'll be uh, favors. Uh, probably not favors. favors but <laughs> you never know. <laughs> you never know. I love I that mean, option. I'm not you know? it's, it's, yeah. it's a good option. I just don't think it's it's the most efficient way to allocate resources. <laughs> probably not. That's true. That's true. <sighs> See, now I'm torturing the editor person, but Kelly, <laughs> thank you for coming on the show. It's been very fun to talk to you. Thank you for having me. It's been super fun. And where on the internet can people find you? And if there's anything else you want to tout or shout out? Um, yeah, I am on Twitter at Peace Not Peas. So P E A C E, not Peas, P A S, because peas are disgusting and peace is great. <laughs> And then I'm on Letterboxd if you want to see what movies I'm watching. It's Kelly VK, just the letter V, not spelled out. And I'm on Instagram at Sensational She Hulk if you want to see my cosplays. <laughs> and you should, you should. <laughs> um, yes, and the universe can follow me on Twitter still limping along on Twitter at Lucy Stag, L-U-C-Y-S-T-A-D. I'm actually on Mastodon, which is really funny because I didn't think that would ever take off. Um, Kelly, well, let's have you on again sometime because this was very good. So thank awesome. Thank you. This is fun. I haven't done this in years. So. <laughs> you
listening to the Non-Servian Podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, why not subscribe over on our YouTube channel or on your favorite podcast platform. You can also follow us across social media on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and Mastodon. If you're extra interested in seeing this project continue, consider becoming a patron over at patreon.com. But if you can't contribute financially, we still like you a whole lot. And you can help us out just by liking and sharing this episode or any other one that catches your fancy. As always, shout out to our existing patrons. Your support helps us reach a larger audience and helps keep this project alive. Thanks so much. <laughs>